There we go, it's gone. All right, uh, today we are talking about something that happened 31 years ago, 31 years ago, on this date. And some of the fallout that happened. Uh, over the years on this day, I've had uh, people know exactly what I was talking about for the first, I don't know, maybe 10 years or more that I would talk about this. Uh, so until the early aughts, I guess. It's interesting that it coincides with the post 9-11 world. Uh, that we don't talk about it and that people don't know about it. Uh, to me. That uh, in my many years of going through the processes of like, you know, using uh, the public as a touchstone wherever I am, whether it's the bar or the coffee shop or the uh, newspaper stand or the bus stop or the subway or the uh, train or whatever. And on this day, Valentine's Day, since 1989, I've, I, it hasn't been Valentine's Day to me because uh, it is the 31st anniversary of the fatwa that was placed on the author Salaman Rushdie in 1989 by the Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini. He issued a fatwa calling for the death of the author of the Satanic Verses book, which is against Islam, the Prophet, and the Quran, close quote. And uh, if you do not know about that, uh, it could be because of your age, you know, not really because you... It just is interesting how in many ways it got somewhat... diminished in importance because of the collective consciousness thinking about Islamic terrorism against all of us in the form of 9-11. And in the case of Salman Rushdie, he represents something that we as artists and writers in particular have a special connection to this because this is not about uh, Islamic terrorism against some general concept of the Western world which, by the way, is still a suspect rationale for the uh, war on terror that's being embarked upon. But rather, specifically an author writing in English a fiction, and a good author at that, and a novel fiction at that, and a remarkable book, in which, by the way, if you haven't read it, I do recommend that you do. And um, in 1990. One. So this is two years after the Ayatollah Khomeini uh, issued the fatwa, right? And the world was freaking out, and Salman Rushdie had to go into hiding, obviously, and it, it's intense to think about. Uh, the man's life was changed forever, you know. Um, so two years later, in March, right? of 1991, he issued a further fatwa. He said, there's a multi-million dollar bounty for the head of, quote, any of those involved in its publication who are aware of its content, close quote. So this was two years later. This was 29 years ago. But can you imagine that in this modern era? Pick up the phone, the FBI is at your door, and they're like, get under the table, we're all standing around you. And you're like, what? Oh, a book you wrote last year that you were like excited about because this new novel you wrote has just been called heretical by a living representative of a religion who has called for your death. Uh, this is insanity, it can't be allowed. This is not something in a free world that we can have happen. It was a horrifying uh, time for Salman Rushdie, I'm sure. You can read all about it. If you don't know much about this, you should look it up. 
but I've noticed now when I go to the coffee shop and I ask people on Valentine's Day, hey, you know, remember the fatwa happened on this day? They don't, they don't know who Salman Rushdie is. They don't know about the fatwa. They don't know about any of this uh, now. For at least two, three years, it's been, I'll get to back to the studio and buy this. I've mentioned it and no one around, you know, seven, eight, ten people don't know what I'm referring to. And the ones who do, it's like a vague thought in their minds. But the singular importance uh, uh, of this is that uh, it represents freedom of us to write freely and uh, many other things. But it gets heavy. Two years later, he says this. He says, uh, anybody uh, involved in the publication or aware of its content. And three months later, Igarashi, Kitoshi Igarashi, uh, an associate professor of comparative Islamic culture at the University of Tsukuba in Japan. Uh, he had translated uh, Avicenna's The Canon of Medicine and Salman Rushdie's Satanic Verses. And he wrote books on Islam, including the Islamic Renaissance and Medicine and Wisdom of the East. He was uh, stabbed to death repeatedly in the face and arms by an unknown assailant. His body was found on the 12th of July of 1991 in his office at the University of Tsukuba in Ibaraki, Japan. In 2006, the case was closed without having determined any individual suspects, according to Wiki. Uh, Kenneth M. Pollock alleged in The Persian Puzzle, a book that the attack was a covert operation by the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, but again, these, there's no citation for these. According to this unverified rumor, again unverified, the Japanese government has refrained from anger over controversy over the book. Well, when I was in San Francisco, uh, we were part of a thing called Media Alliance. It was a nonprofit. I think it's still there. I just went and saw the website. Um, it's probably a lot different now, but. You know, it was a place where you could go if you were a young writer or author or artist, and they had job binders, you know, this was before the internet. So companies in the Bay Area would list in these job binders, and you could go, I would go there a couple, three times a week to look for jobs. Writing jobs, you know, is what I was looking for, but there were all kinds of things, editing, photography. Uh, it's kind of in that er dawn of the digital era, so it's not really filmic yet, you know, and the internet doesn't really exist yet. I mean, it exists by protocol in 93, but, you know, it's not really a thing yet. And in San Francisco, uh, Media Alliance was um, cool. You know, I liked it. I, I hung out there a lot, and we were talking about different ways we could talk about Media Alliance as an organization, which defends, you know, the rights of people who are marginalized as writers and, and cares about helping people who are struggling to write. And one of the things we did was we made a button that said, I am Salman Rushdie, right? And Media Alliance was on it. I just made a little fake one today because, you know, the idea was, I and I was out a lot wearing it, you know, and uh, especially looking like an Indian person, you know, it was, uh, I wouldn't call it like courageous per se, because I don't think that that threat existed in 94 for a person like myself who had not done anything with the book, but was standing up for Salomon Rushdie's right to not be threatened for writing a book. Um... But every Valentine's Day, I think about that, and it comes up. And so I was at the coffee shop this morning, and I was asking, and nobody had heard of the circumstance. And um, uh, Igarashi Hitoshi, yeah, a Japanese translator of the work, unsolved. That's an unsolved crime that we can lay in this place. Maybe bringing it up today isn't a good idea, but it was on my mind, and I do feel... We ought not forget it. We ought not forget it. And the other thing I found this week, which I was kind of excited about, is, uh, okay, I bought that print there, the Visit Palestine print by Franz Krauss. Remember, that's a print from before the time Israel existed. That's from 1936 by Franz Krauss, Visit Palestine. What a beautiful thing. It is apolitical in its existence. There's no way you can politicize that. And somehow, accidentally, it has become associated with uh, all kinds of things. I had been looking for the notes from my trip when I bought that. I bought that uh, 
print in Old Jerusalem 17 years ago. Uh, well, this coming December, it'll be 17 years ago this December. And I found my notes from the trip, and they're very heavy. And I, I was using these notes for a book that I'm making, a fine art book. But I thought maybe we would... I'm thinking about maybe just reading these aloud at some point to talk about Palestine and Israel in the context of uh, my trip there 17 years ago as a witness to things that were there. And um, that's it. Just wanted to place that on the net, you know? Um, I produced a ton of material from that, and it is with Pacifica Radio. I'm very proud of that material. You can get it from the Pacifica Radio archives, MTK in the OPT. It's MTK like in the Occupied Palestinian Territories. So I filed it under MTK in the OPT. So if you just contact Pacifica and you can say, can I get the MTK in the OPT content, you'll have all of that. And uh, you'll be supporting Pacifica Radio archives, which is a good thing to do. And... I was thinking about the Palestine trip recently because of the way news has been about this in, in, in name, truly in name and brutal and inhumane and completely anti-intellectual, purely capitalized thing that Trump has thrown out there for us to consider as a possible quote way forward. And um, so I thought I might break that stuff out, you know, um, even going out, but 262 days until election day, and there was something else I was going to cover here, but I'm like concerned about the thing not really working, so we're just going to kill it, but uh, there you go, today's content was about something that happened 31 years ago that resulted in a 29-year-old unsolved assassination. Something that happened 31 years ago today that caused an unsolved disaster. Can't really see it with this uh, lighting, can you? That isn't even what it looked like. If I'm honest, it was. It was the beginning of the days of digital printing, you know, the Mac had been out and you could make your papers look cool by having nice fonts and stuff and button makers were kind of like easy to make, you know, stuff. And it's a non-profit org, you know, so we would, it's like a nice font, media lights, 